Good morning, everybody. Peace be with you. Hallelujah. Good to see you. We have to do this India style now, okay? If you go to India, what you're going to find is gonna, we're going to do it three times. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. I just did my uh, Pastor George imitation. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we do. He might, he might be watching this. I don't know. <laughs> So, but you have to use both hands, so you can't just do one. I just, I had the microphone in my one hand here, so. But it's good to see you, and uh, good to gather in the house of the Lord. So, uh, everybody enjoying this nice, cool weather we're having here lately, mm. so. All right, well, just a reminder while I'm, while I'm up here thinking about it, we do have our ministry business meeting this evening, so just a quick, uh, quick reminder, 6.30 in the fellowship hall. So, let's, uh, let's commit our time to the Lord and uh, begin our worship in prayer. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your love for us, which never fails. Mercies are new every morning. Thank you, Lord. We just want to commit ourselves to you, Father. We want to commit the service to you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come manifest the presence of Christ our Lord here today, that you, the Spirit of Jesus, would have free reign in here, that we we want you to come, we want you to have complete freedom, we want to yield this service to you, we want to yield ourselves to you. Lord, we're so aware that we desperately need revival, the church in the United States. We desperately need spiritual awakening in our nation. And so we don't want to begin this service and just kind of go about our own business, ignoring you. We want you to come, Holy Spirit. And so we ask you to move here today in power. We yield ourselves. We center ourselves before you right now, Lord. We're not here just to go through a ritual. We're here to worship you, to adore you, to honor you, to yield to you. And we ask you to change us today. So come, Holy Spirit, come. We invite you, Lord, to touch each one here today, to do within us what you want to do. Lord, I ask that you would release healing today whether that be physical or emotional or spiritual. We know that you are the healer. We just ask you to come. Do the desires of your heart today as we honor you in and through our worship. We pray all this in the mighty name, above every name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
salvation. Jesus Christ is our foundation. is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you have believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you, you are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built
shall come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne When He shall come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless stand before the Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy me. Through every trial, my soul will see. No turning back, I've been set free.
decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided. Good morning. How's everybody today? Good. Um, I would like Barry to come and join me. Barry, Barry. <laughs> come on there. Barry has served as a deacon for the last three years. Um, and at, in the t two of those three years, he has served as our leader of the deacons. And we want to thank Barry. With He has served with loving kindness, and you've been a great leader. And we all appreciate you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure what to say, um, you know, um, even though I was the leader, um, it's not just a one person job, it was all of the deacons. Um, I would try to name them all now, but with my memory, I'm afraid I might miss one, so I'm not going to name them all. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it was definitely, um, I got a lot of help from, from all the deacons and Jim, Richard. So um, yeah, thank you very much. These aren't for you, <laughs> but, we, but we want to, Sherry would be up here, but she is serving, okay, back in uh, the nursery. 
So we would like you to give them to her on behalf of us. And we know that it takes two of you sometimes to, to, to help with this. So thank you and thank Jerry for us. Well, thank you guys. And remember time. now, you only get a year off, okay? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, thank you, Barry, also, and Sherry. Um, this is our time where, in the uh, old days, seems so long ago now, doesn't it? We would have been passing the offertory plates, offering plates. Uh, we're not going to be passing those because of COVID-19, and you all know that. So they are here in the front. They're in various locations, some at the door. Uh, if you'd like to, to give an offering. We do want to pray concerning the offering. I also want to mention at this point that next Sunday we do have a guest speaker who will be coming, June Rodrigo, who is a Filipino missionary. He uh, has been with us several times. He hosted Sandy Taylor and me last year. We went to the Philippines and ministered there. And um, June will be with us sharing how the ministry there is going. His ministry is Philippine, Philippines for Christ, and it supports... Uh, indigenous Filipino pastors there in the Philippines, many of whom are serving in very dangerous places. Uh, so uh, one part of the Philippines in particular, you may not be aware, there's a very large Muslim population, and it, it's, and it tends to be very violent. And um, there have been some deaths uh, of pastors that are tied to this militant Muslim group. So again, many of them are serving in very hazardous uh, circumstances. So anyway, so next Sunday we will actually have two offerings. I just want to make you aware of that. One will be the, the general offering and one will be for Philippines for Christ ministry as well. So I just want to make sure you are uh, aware of that and prepared for that. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for the heart of service that is so prevalent here in this expression of the body. We thank you, Lord, that you came to serve us, not to be served. You gave us that example. We just want to commit our offerings today, Lord, our tithes and offerings to you. We commit them to you. We thank you that you have entrusted them to us. You've called us and trained us to be good stewards of your resources. And, and so, Lord, we, we bring them to you now. We ask them to use these resources for the work of your kingdom here on the earth. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our midst, all that you're accomplishing. Thank you, Lord. We just want to give you all honor and glory. And we thank you, Lord, also that as we give monetarily, that's not really the offering you're looking for. It's really the offering of ourselves, our hearts. And so, Lord, we present ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, well, today we are going to be looking at the mystery of lawlessness part five and I promise you this is the last one because <laughs> I would have said that last Sunday but uh, so you know but this is the last one uh, quite frankly I'm tired of talking about it and if I'm tired of talking about it I'm sure you're tired of listening to me talk about it so I just want to kind of wrap some things up today tie up some loose ends with part five. We'll be looking at Joshua five thirteen through fifteen. Joshua five thirteen through fifteen.
And Joshua was by Jericho. He lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord bid his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Well, we began this uh, series, parts 1 and 2, back in June, beginning of June, June 7th to 14th. We explored 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 17. It was a general response to what was happening in the nation uh, at that time and is still happening in the nation now as it has carried on. And it was a recognition of the order of God, which is good. God is a God of order versus the order of Satan, which is evil. We must have order on the earth. We talked about the mystery of lawlessness and the man of lawlessness talked about in those in that passage. We also talked about uh, before the end comes there will be the rebellion as it's termed in the scripture. The apostasy. Apostasy means a falling away. It will be a falling away from God. The man of lawlessness typically understood to be the antichrist if that person is embodied in one a uh, human being. There are already spirits of Antichrist on the earth. We're told that in 1 John chapter 4. They have been here from the time of the writing of the New Testament. They are uh, clearly described in their name. They are Antichrist. They are spirits working against the realities of Jesus Christ and the truth of God. So they've been in the world from at least the time of Jesus, probably before, I would imagine. Uh, and uh, it may be that at the end we will see uh, the Antichrist spirit embodied in a human being who is fully controlled by that antichrist spirit and we talk a lot about that at the beginning of the series we also read in that passage that the man of lawlessness is being restrained for now there are different theories on what exactly is restraining the man of lawlessness uh, i believe it is government and we talked about the role of government and so forth we saw that government is instituted on the earth uh, by God to bring order on the earth. There is no perfectly righteous government, uh, but God can use even imperfect governments to keep order as opposed to chaos, which is evil. All right, we see a lot of chaos in our nation right now, and a lot of people who are trying to foment chaos on purpose. Part three, we looked at uh, July 5th. There was a break in there because of Richard's retirement as associate pastor and also uh, my bout with the shingles on my face, and so I asked uh, Matt, our youth minister and young adult minister, to, to speak uh, that following, that, that Sunday, because I wasn't sure what shape I'd be in. And so July 5th, we looked at uh, perfect government is a future hope. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, the government will rest upon his shoulders, and that'll be a glorious day, but we're not there yet. And then we looked at America in crisis, and we talked about the wisdom of Solomon being necessary in these days. And we looked at 1 Kings 3, 1 through 28, the story of the two harlots who bring to King Solomon a living baby. They both had had children uh, who were very, very close in age. During the night, one of the children suffocated. There was one living child. Uh, one of the mothers apparently substituted uh, her own dead child uh, went and, and put that with the, the other mother and uh, took the, the mother's living child and, and claimed that child is her own and so there's a dispute about which mother is the child's mother and King Solomon famously calls for a sword after he's listened to this back and forth between the two mothers and he says we're going to split the baby in half and give half to each mother and the real mother cries out don't do that give the child to the other woman because she wanted that child to live and Solomon recognizes, okay, that's the mother. 
uh, give the child to that, that woman. The other mother was like, yeah, split it in half. She shouldn't have it. So I use that illustration to talk about the United States of America right now. And I ask the question, should this child live? The United States. Should this child live? That's really where we are right now. And there is a mother, if you will, a harlot, because we're not perfect as a nation, never have been, who loves that child and wants the child to live. There's another harlot, also imperfect, who would just as soon destroy the child because there's no real love for America there. So I asked the question, without America, then what? As I look around the world, I don't see any other nation that can carry forth a cause of freedom in any meaningful way. Uh, with all of our imperfections, I just don't see anything better out there or anything that promises to be better. We're the only nation on earth that has that its foundational, uh, its foundational identity that all men are created equal, inscribed in our founding documents. And yes, we have, uh, we have implemented that in an imperfect way, and we're paying for that now in, in many ways. Uh, but I don't see any other nation that could do any better than we have done as a nation. Uh, so without America, what? You just cut the child in half? You kill the child and say, yeah, you know, each of us will get half of a dead child. That seems to be the attitude uh, for a lot of people right now because there's no love for America, certainly not as America has stood in the past. And so the solution is just to kill the baby even though there's nothing better to offer. So part four, which was last Sunday, July 12th, we talked about repentance and forgiveness. Both are necessary if there's to be healing in this land, and I took us through an American history lesson, and that was purposeful, and we're going to run through that again very quickly today. And we talked about the founding of the nation. We talked about the seed of freedom being planted in the soil of compromise in order to form the nation. With confidence, the American people would ultimately abolish slavery. There were founders, founding fathers, who really worked hard to get into the Declaration of Independence a clause that would abolish slavery. Ultimately, the southern colonies, whose economies depended upon slavery in large measure for the labor, uh, wouldn't go along with that. They had to, literally had to strike it out of the Declaration of Independence, and they had to settle on a compromise. As I shared last week, here are these 13 small colonies clinging to the eastern shore of this vast continent. They're up against the world superpower in Great Britain, and they had to survive. That was the first order. If you're going to declare independence, you've got to be able to survive. The only way they could survive was to come together and, and, and present a united front against England, they chose to do that. The founders wrote about this, those who were wanting to abolish slavery at the beginning, and uh, they agonized over this uh, because they really wanted to abolish slavery. They knew it was an evil, but they also took some comfort and solace in the fact that they believed they had planted that seed of freedom that would ultimately grow into freedom for all people, including those who were enslaved, and that slavery would ultimately be abolished. They wrote about these things. So they, they weren't men without conscience. Uh, they weren't just evil men because some of them owned slaves and so they're irredeemable. They were complex human beings just as we all are. There is an attitude today from many that will, that it's a tyrannical attitude. It will not allow any deviation from current political and the moral standards uh, and the politically correct uh, stance of right now and it won't allow any reading back into history the circumstances of that day. And uh, as we've talked about before, the, the, the PC standard seems to shift from week to week practically. And if you're not right in step right now, then you're bad. And so they keep moving the goalpost and it's almost impossible to keep up. And it's really a form of fascism and tyranny. So, and we see a lot of that happening right now, uh, today. So uh, people are literally being taught in school 
in our universities that George Washington was evil because he was a slave owner, and that's all they know about him. Literally all they know about him. They don't know anything else. They don't even know, what, they don't even know what century the Revolutionary War took place in. I mean, the ignorance is, is truly astounding. It really is, and it's, it's a terrible indictment of our education system in this nation. We've allowed that to happen. The church has allowed that to happen. We've been asleep, and we have allowed this to happen. Uh, and so we bear a lot of fault before God for that. So compromise was present at the beginning in order to survive as a beginning nation. And so the original sin of slavery has been repented of throughout our history in substantive, substantive and practical ways. That was the point of the history lesson last Sunday. Uh, the 1619 Project of the New York Times, which is being adopted into our universities and will also show up in our high schools, posits that the, the history of the United States, the entire history of the United States began in 1619, not 1607 with the foundation of Jamestown, but in 1619 because that's when the first African slaves were brought to Virginia. And so the, the whole history of the United States begins in 1619, which is a number of years after Jamestown actually was founded. And so the whole 1619 project is, is based upon a lie. And there are many other lies that are going to be taught as absolute truth in the 1619 project. This is revisionist history at its worst. Uh, and this is what we're going to be seeing more and more of. And uh, the, the perspective is that because of this original sin of slavery, we are irredeemably flawed. America just has to die. This child has to die. Can't redeem it, can't fix it, has to die. Start all over again. This is what is literally being said today. So I talked about how did we repent as a nation? How have we done that? Now, there's still work to be done. Um, we understand people have suffered. We understand that individuals have had bad experiences with the police, for example. There's a phrase in the black community, driving while black that you're, you're pulled over by the police because you're black. There's no other reason. You're, you're just driving along, especially young black men. They're driving a car. Maybe they're in a white neighborhood. You get pulled over by the police. Driving while black. That's all they're guilty of. And so we, we acknowledge these things. We need to work on these things. We know there's pain associated with these things. Um, we're not trying to deny that, but we, we, we're, we're trying to go back to history and say, well, you know, we, we have worked if we're systemically racist, then how has the system worked to repent? How have we as a nation worked in the system to repent? And so I want to talk about that again very briefly today. Again, we're wrapping this up. Uh, there was tension over slavery as the nation expanded. As I said, at the very beginning of the nation, there was tension. They wanted to abolish slavery, many of the founders. They couldn't work it out politically to do it at that point. That doesn't mean the tension over slavery went away. It continued, and so there was this ongoing tension, especially as new territories were brought into uh, the United States. Uh, what do you do with slavery in those new territories, for example? A lot of passion about this. You had a lot of passion about this about Missouri. You had a lot of passion about this over Kansas. Uh, these new territories, what do you do with slavery? And there was this thing called the Missouri Compromise that was struck, that uh, above a certain uh, line, you, you wouldn't allow slavery to advance. So in the new territories, you wouldn't allow slavery. Um, that was struck down by the Dred Scott decision. I talked about that uh, last Sunday in 1858. We'll talk about that uh, briefly again today. Uh, what do you do with that? And so the nation was grappling with this. This is the point, okay? The nation was grappling with this. It hadn't gone away. People still wanted to abolish slavery. You had people like Harriet Tubman and many others who were abolitionists who were working to free slaves. The Underground Railroad is the, the term given to that network of, of uh, people and, and locations where slaves who ran away from the owners in the South uh, could travel, find uh, a place to stay, could be maybe given some resources to continue to travel on into the North to a place of freedom. And Harriet Tubman, an amazing uh, African-American woman uh, who uh, helped in that process. So all this is going on. Okay, so it wasn't like we found at the nation, we just forgot about the problem with slavery and everybody's fine with that. Okay, we got slaves, everybody's fine with that. That wasn't the case uh, at all. 1861 to 1865, 
there was a bloody civil war to decide whether legal slavery would continue in the USA. And I say legal slavery on purpose because there is still slavery here. Human trafficking, for example, it's still here. Still a huge problem and a huge problem in the rest of the world. But uh, this civil war largely fought over this issue of can people own other people? The South's economy, again, built on. You need a large number of workers for the manual labor, especially associated with cotton, picking cotton, processing cotton. They didn't have the machinery at that point to do it. And so you had, you had people who did it. And, um, and this, the Civil War largely fought over this very question of slavery. There were other issues, states' rights, and so forth. But basically, it boiled down to the issue of slavery, ultimately. And the abolitionists understood that. Abraham Lincoln understood that. When he debated his opponent, uh, for, when running for president, Stephen Douglas, uh, Stephen Douglas was the Democrat. He, he, he spoke for slavery, keeping slavery in place. Abraham Lincoln, the abolitionist Republican candidate, who then became the first Republican president, said, no, we need to abolish slavery. This was the whole debate going on in the nation at that time. It had been going on for a long time. 600,000 to 700,000 Americans died in the Civil War over this issue of slavery. I mean, think about that number. I don't remember the, the, the precise number in the Vietnam War. It was 5,000 something, 5,000 plus, who died in the Vietnam War. Think about how traumatic the Vietnam War was for this nation. 5,000 something people died. Less than 6,000 soldiers died in the Vietnam War. 600,000 to 700,000 Americans died. You had battles where 20,000 men would die in a single battle in the Civil War. Many of them were literally brothers fighting brothers. There were literally families ripped in part, and you, and you literally had a brother in the Union Army and, and his brothers in the, in the Rebel Army, Confederate Army, fighting on opposite sides of this cause. This was such a traumatic event for the, for the nation. It was a, a terrible, awful war. It was the first modern war in many ways, so the level of uh, of death and, and just carnage was incredible. We began to mechanize more efficiently uh, the weapons of war, and there was this terrible carnage. It was an awful, awful experience. And Abraham Lincoln saw it as the judgment of God on the nation for the sin of slavery. But it was a war fought to right that wrong. And so my, my point was, it was a form of repentance. We were turning around. We said, we don't, don't like this, don't want it anymore. We're repenting of the sin of slavery. We saw the period of Reconstruction after the war. Civil Rights Act of 1866, you had the first black congressmen, who were all Republicans, uh, by the way. And so I said, well, you, you just politicize this. You know, you talk a lot about Democrats versus Republicans. I do that because the Democrat Party has always been the party of slavery, always. It has always been the party that manipulated and took advantage of black Americans, always. Still is, in my view. The Republican Party, certainly not perfect, far from it. But they were the abolitionist party. They were the ones who fought for the civil rights. They're the ones who passed the Civil Rights Act of, 1864, of 1964. The Democrats mostly voted against it. If it hadn't been for the Republicans voting for it, it would never have passed. But because we had a Democrat president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, somehow or other the Democrats got credit for the Civil Rights Act and this whole narrative got switched up, up, upside down, switched on its head. It's really kind of amazing if you go back and study history. And so I talk a lot about this because we have a two-party system. So if you're, if you're after policies that, that might actually help black Americans in the inner cities, my, I would tell you that the Republican uh, policies are more effective at, at actually helping them, as opposed to promises that have been offered by Democrats for decades that have never been fulfilled. And we see this rolled out every four years like clockwork at election cycle. Promises are made, racial tension is, is uh, stoked, over this, you know, when it's time for an election, and then after the election goes by, it all calms down again. Four years later, Al Sharpton and other people come out of the woodwork, right? 
And that's all they do. They stir this up. And so we see this happen again and again and again. And so I talk about Democrat versus Republican in terms of their policies because I actually believe, I actually do care about black lives. And I do believe black lives matter. And that's why I talk about Democrat and their policies versus Republicans and their policies. That's exactly why I do it. I'm not a worshiper of Republicans. But I have watched this my entire life, the Democrat Party lying about how much they care about black Americans because their actions don't say they actually care. Their actions undermine black Americans actually getting ahead. It's just truth. But if you say these kinds of things, you're, you know, you're hateful, bigot, to point these things out. Well, I'm sorry. Truth is truth. And uh, that's what's been going on. And so I talk about this, not because, again, I'm a lover of the Republicans versus Democrats. I just love people, and I want to see people given real help, people really help to, to move forward. Uh, and the, the, the policies that have been put forth by the Democrat Party have decimated the black population in the country in terms of uh, the family. The black family has pretty much destroyed the black family in so many ways. Uh, it destroyed the black middle class that was beginning to prosper. Uh, all because government showed up and said, we're here to help, right? You need to run the other direction uh, when that happens. And it's all backfired. Uh, the war on poverty, uh, it's all backfired under Lyndon Johnson. You throw more money at the problem, uh, it all backfires. Look at how much money has been thrown at the schools in the inner cities. An incredible amount of money spent on every student. The schools are abysmally bad in the inner cities, but Guess which party fights against school choice and other policies that would actually allow parents to pick which school their child has, gets to go to? No, they have to stay in those poor, failing schools that have terrible records. They have to stay there. The teachers' unions are, are, in, are colluding with this. The teachers' unions are uh, largely Democrat, controlled by Democrat. Democrat unions. They give to Democrat politicians to Planned Parenthood, which targets 40% of the black population every year with a death in their mother's wombs. It, it's really astonishing. And, and to me, it's very difficult to understand why people can't see this. So, do we really care about black lives? You see, or is it only something we talk about when a black life is taken by a white police officer, then we care about black lives. It seems to be the case with black lives leadership. Black lives matter leadership. All right, well, I got off on that rabbit trail for a little while. The amendments, let's talk about repentance, systemic repentance. 13th Amendment, 1865, abolished slavery in the United States. The 14th Amendment, 1868, guaranteed former slaves were citizens of the USA and their state if they were born here or naturalized here. The purpose of this amendment, as, as we know from contemporaneous records, the purpose was to give slaves citizenship, former slaves, all right? If you were born here uh, or naturalized here, if you were born on American soil or naturalized as a, uh, here, you were a citizen, both of the United States and of the state in which you were born. This uh, fourth, 14th Amendment has been abused terribly. Uh, recently by illegal immigrants coming to this nation, having a baby. The baby's automatically a, 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 a citizen. This was not envisioned by, the, by those who passed this amendment in 1868. And also, as I talked about, literally birthing vacations, people coming from China, whole groups of Chinese women about to give birth. Uh, they, they schedule a vacation here. They come to the U.S., give birth in the United States. Their child's a, a United States citizen. They go back to China. This is literally happening. I'm not making this up. This is what uh, is going on right now. And this is an abuse of the 14th Amendment. It was not intended for that. It was intended to give black Americans citizenship, those former slaves. Then we also had the 15th Amendment, which I left off last time, so I wanted to write that uh, oversight uh, today. 1870, guaranteed black suffrage, the right to vote. This said that the right to vote could not be denied because of race. Now, there could be other reasons why you couldn't vote, but you couldn't be denied the right to vote just based on your race. All right, so 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments. Systemic repentance. 
literally changing our Constitution to uh, make amends. Now, amendments are very difficult to pass. It takes two-thirds of both houses of Congress proposing that amendment or two-thirds of state legislatures proposing a constitutional convention of the states for the purpose of proposing amendments. There is a move right now to call for a constitutional convention. And there's actually quite a few states that have signed on to this already. I believe that's the only way out of this, our mess that we're in, really, in so many ways. We've got to put term limits on the swamp. Guess what? The people in the swamp are not going to vote for. They're not going to vote for term limits. They go into office. Most of them grow incredibly wealthy while they're in public service. How does that happen? Many of them have ties to communist China. They're making a ton of money because of their ties to China. Diane Feinstein has a husband who's got businesses in China. She's on the Foreign Relations Committee. Guess what she's been doing? Moving business toward her husband for decades. Extremely wealthy now. This is what happens in the swamp in, in D.C. A lot of corruption there tied to the money. All right, so if we're going to get an amendment that says you have to have term limits on Congress, it's not happening through the legislatures as they stand right now. You're going to have to have, to have a constitutional convention of the states for the purpose of proposing amendments. Now, the scare tactic that has been used on the other side has been, oh, if you do that, you're going you're gonna to rewrite the entire Constitution. And that's what's, you don't do that, don't do that. You're opening the whole can of worms, you're going to rewrite the whole Constitution, like you're starting from scratch. That is not what happens in a constitutional convention of the states. The states get together, they say, we need to propose amendments. And then we can vote on those amendments that are offered, all right? So that's what happens. I and there is a, a very uh, lively effort right now to try to get enough states together uh, to, to do this. Then, after you've done all that, three-fourths of states must vote for these amendments, either the state legislatures or through a state convention. Three-fourths. So it takes two-thirds, one way or the other, to even call for new amendments, then it takes three-fourths of the states, a super majority, uh, to vote for them in order for them to pass. Now, what's the point? Okay, so the point is this. Americans were determined, determined to change the Constitution to give rights to black Americans that had been denied in the original form of the Constitution. They were it's not, it's not an easy process. They passed three amendments here, 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, difficult to do. They did it because the American people were determined to right that wrong of slavery. And they showed this in a very practical way. They were determined to change the three-fifths representation clause in the House of Representatives, that only three-fifths of the population of the enslaved people would be counted toward representation in Congress. They were determined to change that. They did refer to those people as persons in, in the original language in the Constitution, but uh, the, pro, the, the, the slavery states wanted full representation for their entire population of their state, and uh, that would have given them uh, represent, uh, disproportional representation because the, 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 the slaves could not vote at all. They didn't have a voice. But they're demanding we need representation based upon the entire population. The northern states were like, well, that's not really fair because they can't vote. And so you shouldn't have uh, the entire population, uh, representation based on the entire population, but we will grant uh, that you'll get uh, representation based upon three-fifths of that population of the slaves that are there. So they didn't talk about them as individuals being three-fifths of a, of a white person. That's not what they said. Uh, it's often misquoted uh, that way. It was dealing with whole populations. The language is clear uh, about that. All right, so they were determined to change that. They were determined to overturn the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court, 1858. You know this idea of established precedent, right, with the courts? If established precedent had held, then the Dred Scott decision would have held forever. And the Dred Scott decision said no black person could become a citizen of the United States. And the Dred Scott decision reached beyond that and made it illegal to forbid slavery in the new territories of the nation. So no black person could ever become a citizen. 
and you couldn't stop slavery from spreading to all the other territories that came into the nation. So if precedent had stood, because just like they're trying to argue now with Roe v. Wade, right? You can't overturn that. No matter how bad a decision it is, it stands because the Supreme Court says so. Just a scary thought. Nine unelected people can make law now in our nation. We're seeing it. This balance of power is supposed to be between the three branches of government. There's going to have to be pushback against the Supreme Court because they are so politicized now. There's got to be some kind of balance there. You just can't have nine people who are, who are placed there for life, unelected people, wielding this much power. It can't be allowed to happen that way. All right, so, and we've got to figure this out, right? Got to, got to work on this. So but the point is, if that president had stood, guess what? Who would not be able to vote today? Who would not be citizens today? Black Americans. So you want to argue about precedent? Well, the Supreme Court said so. The Supreme Court said black people couldn't be citizens. You want to say that should be the law of the land today? So what had to happen? A constitutional amendment needed to be passed. And that's what America did. They were determined to overthrow that decision. And they went to great effort to do it. All right, more recently, we've seen the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968. We saw the abolition of Jim Crow. These were state laws discriminating against black people. We've seen desegregation in the schools and so forth. No more separate but equal idea, you know, uh, coloreds only for this water fountain or this bathroom, right? That's all been repented of. We've seen affirmative action legislation which is by definition preferential treatment by law for blacks and other minorities in many situations. The idea being we need to right the wrong, we need to, to address you know, the, the things that have been wrong in the past, we need to give black people a step up uh, to be able to compete. Um, but by definition, it is preferential treatment by law for black people. That's, that's simply what it is at its most basic level. And I would say that there comes a point where that doesn't need to continue anymore. Once you've leveled that playing field, if we have, maybe that needs to be rescinded. Now, is that a hateful white old white guy talking? I don't think so. I think it's just rational. Uh, okay, maybe. Okay, we need to take some steps right now, but at what point do you level the playing field? One of the original uh, proponents of affirmative action legislation was asked in an interview by a reporter, okay, so, so when does that stop? It's a logical question. And he said, stop? He, he had never even considered you would ever stop doing that. You pass this and you continue to give preferential treatment to black people over white people in certain situations. You just do it forever. Well, that's not right, is it? And there's nothing wrong with that. That becomes racism in and of itself, doesn't it? So anyway, that's literally by law Systemically, we, we, we've instituted affirmative action. All right, Barack Obama became the first African-American president, recently elected to serve two terms in office. This is truly amazing and remarkable if we are an irredeemably systemically racist nation, isn't it? I mean, the black population of the United States is 13% of the population. Obama didn't win the presidency with 13% of the vote of the nation, did he? So. An awful lot of other people voted for him. An awful lot of white people who are assumed guilty of systemic racism now in our culture voted for Barack Obama to be president. That's the only way he could have won. And yet, we're still accused of being a systemically racist nation. And I would say there's plenty of evidence here that we actually have repented in very substantive uh, ways. All right, so talk is cheap, uh, but we have repented in so many ways. All right, so I'm missing a slide, which is weird. All right, I don't know what, what happened to that one, but uh, talk is cheap. It seems clear Americans have repented systemically. Uh, we've literally changed our Constitution, our laws, and our practices in uh, these very substantive ways. 
There have been many public ceremonies of repentance. Uh, many, many people have gotten up and said, please forgive us, you know, for our sin of racism. There's been public repentance. This has, been, this has happened many, many, many times. Uh, well, there it is. Well, that's so odd. <laughs> it's a different color on my screen. Maybe that's why I sort of faded out. That's kind of odd. Okay, must be some trick I don't know about PowerPoint. All right, so, uh, but we've literally changed. We've had many public ceremonies of repentance. Uh, what happens if there is no willingness to forgive following America's repentance? This is a question I asked last Sunday. Well, reconciliation and healing are impossible in moving forward together as we focus on becoming a more just society is impossible. So my question last Sunday was, what about forgiveness, right? Is there a point where people need to start forgiving? Again, I'm not saying we're perfect or that we've perfectly addressed all these past sins, but there's some point where there has to be forgiveness offered. And yet we're seeing that unforgiveness is being justified right now in many ways. Racism is, racism is being treated as the unpardonable sin in many ways. We talked about this last Sunday. Jesus didn't say repent 70 times 7. He said forgive 70 times 7. Repentance and uh, forgiveness are both necessary. And you know this is not a war of skin colors. This is a culture war. That's what this is. Racism is a spark being used to light the powder keg to blow up the very governmental system that established all men are created equal at the heart of our national consciousness as Americans. And people know what they're doing with this. It's deliberate. Now we're talking about whiteness, uh, which are basically the values that advance Western civilization. It's now considered bad whether those who have these values are white or black or other people of color. I meant to bring it up here. I have a printout of uh, a display that was actually in the African American Museum, Smithsonian Museum in DC on the mall. They've now taken this down, but this was a display about whiteness, white culture, aspects and assumptions of whiteness and white culture in the United States. And they go down and they list a lot of uh, characteristics of whiteness. Uh, individualism, rugged individualism, family structure, the nuclear family. And they present this as these, these are negatives. Emphasis on the scientific method. Uh, they talk about the history, which we were a Judeo-Christian uh, nation in our founding and our past history. That's just a fact. Protestant work ethic, hard work is the key to success. Uh, delayed gratification, religion, Christianity is the norm, uh, and so on and so on. All right, but this was being presented in the African American Museum in D.C. as a negative. All of these things, whiteness. So now it's, it's not just about racism, it's a war on the culture of whiteness. Even if you're black by skin color, if you share those values, you're expressing whiteness. So if you came to America or were brought to America and America was a melting pot, and we came to be Americans together and we shared these values, if you're black and you share those values that made America what it is, you are practicing whiteness and that's wrong. This is the, this is the narrative uh, today. Now we can argue about, well, are those values the values that, you know, that we should have or not? But the point is, it's more than just about skin color, it's more than just about race, uh, it's about uh, political things, it's, it's about culture, and for a long time, black individuals who don't go along with what is supposed to be black, quote unquote, are called Uncle Toms. They're called a variety of other names. If they happen to be white, if they happen to be conservative, black people uh, who share a lot of values that, that white conservatives share, well, you're an Uncle Tom. You, you know, you're, you're, not a, you're not really a black person. Um, it, it's, it's a cultural thing. This is what is going on right now. So emotions are high. There is so much at stake. Literally life as we know it is at stake. With this coming election, uh, this nation will change dramatically uh, if the left gains power. Dramatically. We won't recognize it anymore. Um, so 
we need to know what's going on. We need to open our eyes. All right. So there's an interesting article recently written by E.W. Jackson, Bishop E.W. Jackson, who's a black pastor in Virginia. He ran for lieutenant governor some years ago. He did not win that race. He founded an organization called STAND, S-T-A-N-D. They wrote this interesting article. Uh, I heard Bishop Jackson speak in person one time, and he said, you know, I, I really don't, it doesn't really matter to me how my ancestors got here at this point. He said, I'm just glad I'm here in the United States because this is the greatest nation on earth. This is a black pastor saying this, all right? You don't, you don't tend to hear this perspective, right? So I just want to share his perspective, all right? And this is a very interesting article, and basically this is what he says. Uh, that Mark, he, this is what he's dealing with. Marxism has not been successful in the past in America. Marxism, by the way, underpinning for communism and socialism. Uh, Marx, Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifest, Manifesto with Friedrich Engels in 1848. It's the underpinning for socialism and communism. Marxism has not been successful in the past in America. Why is that? This is the question he's asking. And I thought it was very insightful. He said, Marxism pits social groups against one another to overthrow the system. It promises utopia, which never comes, by the way. Just look at the Soviet Union, look at communist China, look at Venezuela, look at other places like that. Uh, it always used class resentments. The workers should rise up against the wealthy, the rulers. The workers should rise up against the rulers. And this worked in Russia and China, etc. Notice, by the way, when you listen to Democrat politicians today, how they refer to people who work for a living. They're the workers. Because there's a Marxist underpinning to a lot of what's going on right now. So here's the problem for Marxists in the United States. The American system of capitalism allows for upward mobility for all people. There are no fixed class distinctions, no permanent hopeless economic underclass of workers to be exploited and turned against their elitist oppressors. So what do you do with that if you're a Marxist and you're trying to overthrow the system? Because of our fluidity in our, in our system of capitalism, uh, those who are on the bottom, but they work hard, uh, they, they defer gratification and so forth, uh, they can work their way up. And so they're no longer the oppressed at the bottom of the ladder, right? And so Marxism doesn't work very well because you have opportunity in the United States to improve your, your condition of life. And so Jackson believes the trained Marxists in Black Lives Matter leadership, by their own definition and claim, and others have ingeniously substituted the permanent distinctions of race for class. And this allows for perpetual victimhood. I think this is a brilliant point. All right, you can't, you can't use the economic status anymore because you can change your economic status and improve it, and now you're up here with the elites in our system. You can, you, you can actually make a success of yourself, unlike some of the countries in the past. Uh, and so what do you do with that if you're a Marxist? And so he says, well, they've just substituted race for the worker class. So race becomes the permanently aggrieved class in the culture oppressed by, guess who? The whites, all right? So there's a perpetual victimhood that is established here. So I want to quote from E.W. Jackson. This whole slide is quoting from Bishop Jackson because he makes some really good points here. Again, black pastor. Spike Lee recently said that everything America has was obtained by, quote, theft, racism, and genocide, end quote. Yet he has been wildly successful in this allegedly genocidal country. Billionaires like Oprah Winfrey, BET founder Bob Johnson, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. Pause for a moment. LeBron James has multi-million dollar mansions, $27 million, one of them, $20 million, another one of them. His shoes are being made by Nike by slave workers in China right now. Anybody see any problem here? with hypocrisy, making millions of dollars through slave labor in China. But that doesn't trouble him. It's only here in the United States. The slavery of 160 years ago, or whatever it is now. 
See, it doesn't make sense logically in many ways, does it? Beyonce, Jay-Z, and many other successful Americans of African descent have joined the anti-American crowd. They promote the lie, the lie that all black Americans are victims, no matter how rich, and all white people are oppressors, no matter how poor. This is nothing more than reiteration of Marxist class warfare. Karl Marx believed there is no such thing as a good capitalist because in his view, capitalism corrupts its practitioners. Today's American disciples of Marx are saying there is no such thing as a good white person because they are, they are as inherently racist as the country and capitalist system they created. Racial communism says all white people must apologize, all white people must repent, all white people must bow. All white people must pay. Capitalism must be destroyed and reparations must be wrenched from the oppressors who are all white people. This is the sick vision we are being sold and nearly every institution of cultural influence has bowed to it. Professional sports, the corporate world, journalism, entertainment, colleges and universities, museums, libraries and public schools are all espousing Black Lives Matter propaganda. They refuse to see what is staring them in the face. They are surrendering to a Marxist movement to destroy the very country that made their success possible. Patrice Cullors, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, said recently, we are trained Marxists. That should have been a red flag, a violent warning that this movement is not what it appears to be. The mainstream media ignored it because they are part of what Stalin called useful idiots, helping to bring about their own destruction. What a hateful white man he must be to say things like that. Again, black pastor, Christian pastor. But he's got his eyes open. He doesn't mind speaking the truth. I admire his courage. You can imagine what kind of flack he gets for saying these kinds of things. So, you know, our division because of sin is to divide. Sin separates us, separates us from God, it separates us from other people. And this prevails when we fall away from God. Marxism is a godless ideology and movement which, def which depends on exacerbating division to succeed. Followers of Karl Marx consider religion to be the opiate of the people. Religion is just the opiate of the people because there is no God because communism is always godless. It's always atheistic, which is why they kill hundreds of thousands of people in communist nations. All right, so we understand we do not worship the United States of America or any other nation. We don't worship any particular culture, whether it be white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Pacific Islander, Native American, whatever it may be. We need to always keep this in perspective. And the tendency is always to exalt our own culture and make it the best or the norm. Many who reject whiteness want to put their own culture in its place right now. And uh, some black people have spoken out against that. It's okay to say we need to be equal. It's not okay to say we need to be better than, and they've been beaten down for saying that. Uh, we should be able to celebrate strengths even as we guard against idolatry of culture. Many are now saying any hint of love of country is evil because it is whiteness. I read some, just some shocking articles recently by white Christians, Baptist Christians, uh, who basically say that all white religion is white nationalism covering up for you know, racism and vice versa. Everybody's getting on this, 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 this uh, wagon train here. All right, uh, it's kind of astonishing. So you can't even love the country anymore. You can't say I'm a patriot, I love the United States without being called a, a, a racist uh, because of your whiteness, all right? So, but shouldn't we love our country? Uh, the exiles in Babylon were told by the prophet of God to pray for where they were, pray for the advancement of that nation, pray for the welfare of that nation. We love people where we are. We're here in the United States of America. We can love our nation despite its faults and pray that it would be better. All right, but the current narrative is no, you can't even do that. If, you, if you're a patriot in any form, you're a racist. All right, so let's talk about Joshua real quickly and then we're gonna close it out. 
Joshua faces the impossible here when we encounter him. Uh, he's brought, Moses has died, now he's in charge. Uh, he's bringing them across the Jordan to enter the promised land, but they've got uh, adversaries in their way, starting with the city of Jericho, which was considered undefeatable because of its walls. Joshua circumcised the males who had come through the wilderness. This generation had not seen the Exodus. This is, these are the verses right before our passage. Um, all those who had seen the Exodus had died, except for Joshua and Caleb, uh, because they said, we can't go in there. God won't, won't give us a victory. And they were afraid to go in. So he's reclaiming identity uh, of God's people, the uniqueness of their identity. Circumcision was the mark of the covenant. All right, so he circumcises all the men uh, as they're ready to go into battle, getting prepared for that. Uh, they celebrated the Passover for the first time since Egypt. They, this is a remembrance of God's impossible, miraculous deliverance from Egypt as they prepared to face their fear and go up against, all, uh, against an unbeatable enemy. They're getting ready to try to take down Jericho. When Joshua encountered the angelic commander, he's told to take off his shoes, respect the holiness of God, show some awe in the presence of God. He's given the impossible strategy for a miraculous victory. This is right after he encounters the angelic commander against this impregnable city. Uh, it's a spiritual battle first. He already knew from reports from the spies who had encountered Rahab, as you recall, that the fear of God was already on the city. God had already visited that city in that sense. They were afraid of God, and they were afraid of the Hebrews. Uh, and so the victory was already uh, uh, pretty much assured at that point because of the fear of the people. Uh, he was told God must be honored in all spoils of victory over Jericho. Give God credit for the victory. Don't keep anything. It all has to be dedicated to God. Now, they didn't do this. One individual, Achan, saw some things, coveted those things, hid them in his tent. He kept them for himself. And when they went up against Ai, the next city, they were defeated. All right? So they didn't honor God fully. And Jericho was the tithe. It was the first city of ten. God gets the tithe. All right, so the question is, whose side are we on? If we ask that question, how do we answer that? The commander of the army of the Lord was not on Israel's side or Jericho's side, was he? Was he? He was on God's side. God had a purpose. Joshua was called to come into agreement with God's purposes at that time. And we must be like Joshua, strong and courageous, willing to follow the Lord's leading. So the solution for us, recognize this is a spiritual battle. Revival and spiritual awakening are necessary because this is the heart of God. We must be on the Lord's side, not America's side, the Lord's side. And if we conflate the two as if they're totally inseparable, we make a huge mistake. America is just a nation of flawed human beings. So patriotism that goes to that extent where it becomes a substitute religion is wrong. Or it becomes God itself is wrong. But we can love this nation and pray for it and see the benefits that it has and, and pray for its improvement. So we can't expect or assume God to be on our side. We have to be on his side. So let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that you have your purposes on the earth. We thank you that your word teaches that somehow the man of lawlessness is being restrained for now. As we've talked about, uh, one way you do that is uh, through government on the earth. You put governments into place and you take them out of place. Nations rise and fall. We've seen it all through world history. We know that the United States of America is just another, it's just another nation in, in many ways. Um, you didn't guarantee we would be here forever. As long as we honor you and serve your purpose, we will stand. But when we dishonor you and fail to recognize you and no longer serve your purpose, we will fall. Lord, we acknowledge all of that. We do ask you to forgive our sin. Forgive our sins as a nation. Lord, we know that even though, as I've, as I've pointed out systemically, in the area of law, the nation has repented in, in significant and substantive ways of the sin of slavery that was present at the founding. And yet we, we understand that in human hearts, 
there are still many problems. And, and racism still lives in the hearts of many, many people. And it doesn't matter what skin color they are. This idea of, of a racial divide doesn't just flow one direction. It's true, no matter what color your skin is. We can be prejudiced against another person because they're not like us. And we can feel resentment toward a whole race of people because of some wound we've received or bad experience we've had. Lord, we pray for healing in this nation. We pray that you would free us from the shackles of racism, that you would pull down the stronghold, spiritual stronghold of racism in the nation, no matter what form that takes. We pray that you would help us as Americans to become a more just and righteous nation, a more just and righteous people. Lord, we know that time often takes care of a lot of these things. Centuries ago, the, the Angles hated the Saxons in England. And today we talk about Anglo-Saxons. There's no distinction anymore. Time took care of that one. And even today, we, we see this happening. More and more, uh, the melting pot of the, of the races, the cultures, the skin, colors, Lord, we're, we're getting more and more to be homogeneous in, in many ways, just through time and intermarriage. And we know that the demographic studies show that America will not be predominantly white, majority white, in the very, very near future. That that is shifting. And so, Lord, in a, in a way, we're fighting, there's this battle against the straw man of whiteness or the white people. And that's all going to pass away very, very soon, this majority of white people. So, Lord, help us just to love each other, to recognize what you're doing, to allow your Holy Spirit to bring the healing in our hearts that is needed over time. We recognize that with each succeeding generation, typically some of those old attitudes fall away. And Lord, we thank you for that. We pray for your help in those areas where we still struggle, where we still hold resentments, where we still harbor racism in our own hearts. We pray for a better future for this nation for future generations. Lord, we pray for wisdom at this time. And again, we recognize that there is so much more going on here than just a battle over race. There's a whole battle going over about culture right now, about a political future, about political ideology, political systems. And it's all coming together right now. It's all coming together in this perfect storm right now. And we're facing, with this coming election, a pivotal moment in American history where we will either uh, turn our back on what America has been in the past, the good elements of that, or we will embrace a totally different approach. Or we will continue to, to embrace America and to seek its improvement. Lord, uh, Give us wisdom as a people, as a nation. Open our eyes where there has been deception. Help us to understand and to see. And help us, Lord, again, not to fall into a partisan divide, uh, not to uh, just assume automatically that people who think differently than we do are the enemy, but help us to be on your side, your side, not try to manipulate you and force you onto our side whichever side that may be. Lord, we want to be a godly people, a people who honor you. And so we pray, Lord, for awakening. We pray for revival in the church and for spiritual awakening in the nation. And we pray for your hand of guidance and protection upon this people. We thank you for the many blessings that we have known in the United States of America. We thank you for the way it has served as a lighthouse for the gospel in so many ways all around the world. And again, we ask for your forgiveness for our sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. All right, so God bless you.
Thank you for bearing with me through this. I know this, this is a heavy topic. We do need to continue to be in prayer for our nation. Uh, as we close out, uh, just the invitation as we give at the end of every service, if you'd like to receive prayer, you're welcome to stay. People will be here at the front to pray for you if you'd like, like to get prayer for any need. Uh, Lord, send us out of here covered with your grace and your mercy. Help us to represent you wherever we go. Lord, we pray for encounters in this coming week, opportunities, divine encounters, opportunities to demonstrate the love of Christ in some way uh, to, to someone, maybe someone who's on the other side of this, this issue, maybe than where we are personally. Help us just to represent you wherever we go. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So go in peace, the love and serve the Lord.